So first off, I just wanted to say welcome and thank you so very much for coming out this evening to attend the Somers Partners in Prevention fourth annual community forum. I'm Kathy Cucciarella. I'm the chairperson for the uh, Somers Partners in Prevention. And um, as I said, this is our fourth year in doing this. Um, we've invited the community to come out and we've had different speakers speak at each of these uh, sessions. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the dangers of vaping, but first I wanted to give you a little bit of background about Somers Partners in Prevention. Uh, as some of you may know, the Somers Partners in Prevention has been in existence since 2014. But what you might not know is we've actually, as a town-supported volunteer organization, we've actually been an organization since 1969. Under various names, we've been called the Somers Drug Abuse Pro Prevention Council, the Somers Narcotic Guidance Council, and the Somers Substance Abuse Council. We decided in 2014 as a team that we wanted to change our name to the Somers Partners in Prevention because we realized we really needed partners in order to effectively deliver our mission, which is to bring education and awareness to our community about the dangers of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and, and not making those smart choices. Um, again, the name Partners, because we need partners. We partner with various organizations within the community. Um, as I mentioned before, our mission is to build a safer community by efficiently addressing alcohol and drug use, as well as other risk-taking behaviors through advocacy, hope, and awareness. We have a team, and I'm gonna just ask for our team to stand. We have a team of guest members and actual approved members by the town board. And I view them all as a team because we all roll up our sleeves and we uh, deliver what we need to deliver to the best of our abilities for this town. So I just wanted to take a few minutes and if Bob Berman could stand up. Bob, Carol Sirico, she's in the audience here, Christine McDonald, Pat Otis, Jeff Getman, where's Jeff? Jeff, thank you for hosting us here tonight. Jeff's the middle school principal here. Um, Mark Bear, high school principal, Ashling Baines, in the back over there, Kathy Casella over here. Uh, I don't know if Karen is here yet. Uh, nope, I don't see her. Um, Chief Driscoll is over there. And uh, let's see, Kiva? Where's Kiva? Behind me. Kiva's behind me. Kiva Young, right? Uh, Tony Sirico, our town councilman, is over in the corner over there. And I think uh, this evening, I think I've gotten everybody as far as our key members. We also have partners here tonight. We have uh, Christine Mahoney representing, I'm getting to you, Christine. Christine Mahoney representing Somers Education Foundation. Um, in the back, we have our drug crisis in our backyard, Steve and, uh, and um, Solomon, Susan Solomon, sorry. Um, so some of our members are here. Kathy's with our Northeast Rotary Club. So as you can see, we have partnerships we have Paul Espina from the Leos and Lions over there, I see. Uh, but we have partnerships within our community uh, so that we can partner and become more effective with what we need to do. We typically meet once a month, usually the fourth Tuesday of the month, at the Somers Townhouse, um, and all are welcome. You don't have to be a member, all are welcome. And we've had people just stop in one, two, three meetings, and then eventually sometimes they all become members. And sometimes they're just there to, to um, to hear different things. Um, some of our things that we've done, some of the accomplishments, we've partnered to bring speakers to the town, to the students at both middle school and high school, uh, to the community and evening programs. We've bought, brought in speakers like Chris Heron, Bobby Petroselli, um, Stephanie Marquezano came to speak about co-occurring disorders last year at our third annual. Uh, community forum. We've had Jeffrey Veach come, a neighbor of ours from Yorktown Heights, to talk about uh, his, uh, his efforts to raise awareness after losing his son to an overdose. Um, but basically, we have done uh, as much as we can possibly do on our own. That's why we partner. And again, I keep using the word partner because that's so critical and important. If you think about the students at the high school, we have 1,200 students at Somers High School. We've had speakers come here to the middle school. Six, seven hundred students have heard these speakers as well. And hopefully we're educating them and raising the awareness so that they can make smart and healthy choices. We've also done things like we've offered Narcan training. 
Uh, we've worked with the chief and the county to bring Narcan training to the, uh, to the town of Somers for those that want it. We're also always bringing awareness on the prescription drug take back program. Uh, you can drop off your unused, unwanted, uh, leftover drugs over at the Somers Police Station. There's a lock box there. This is what it looks like. It's a green box. It's locked. The chief then collects it at a certain point and brings it down to Valhalla where it's environmentally uh, friendly incinerated. So we want to clean out those medicine cabinets and get as much out of those cabinets that we don't need so that they cannot be used inappropriately. You will see our presence at Somers High School and Somers Middle School open houses, our annual Celebrate Somers in the fall, the Somers High School Volunteer Fair. We've been uh, before the LEOs groups, the Lions, the Northeast Westchester Rotary Club meetings to speak to their members and their executive boards. So that's a little bit about the Somers Partners in Prevention. And now I just want to go over a little bit about the housekeeping for rules for tonight before we get into our keynote speaker. Um, there are refreshments in the back. Feel free to stop, you know, step out and take one. There's coffee, water, some, some uh, cookies. Feel free to just grab something now or at the end. Uh, the restrooms are located right outside these doors, and if you look, the exits are here um, and on the sides here. Okay? So that's just some housekeeping. Basically, what we're going to do tonight is in a few minutes, I'm just going to introduce one of our members, Kiva Young-Wright, who's going to talk to you about ESPERT. Kiva works at Northern Westchester Hospital, and she'll be speaking to you about that for a few minutes. And then what we will do is we'll have our keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Stumacher, who's also standing back over here. He will come speak to you about the dangers of vaping. Dr. Stumacher is the Chief of Pulmonology and Critical Care at Northern Westchester Hospital, um, and he will talk to you about his, what his findings are and his efforts, and uh, he's also brought some show-and-tell materials so you can actually see what some of these tools look like. So right now, what we're going to do is we are going to introduce, I'm going to introduce Kiva to come up, and remember then after Dr. Stumacher speaks, we'll have a Q&A, and then after that, feel free to hang around, have some refreshments, and have, um, you know, any other questions that you might not feel comfortable asking in public, Dr. Stumacher will be here. But again, thank you all for coming, and I'm going to introduce Kiva right now. So, Kiva, thank, thank you so much. So um, I'll be super brief because we are really fortunate to have my colleague, Dr. Stumacher, here. He really has blazed the trail in this area on vaping education. Um, there really was nobody doing this, and um, I can attest to the fact that on any given week, we get several requests. Um, Dr. Stumacher is uh, not only an extraordinary physician, but he's a father, and his kids are home tonight, and he is here on his own time. So just as a colleague, I am so grateful to you, but as a member of this community, um, I'm a parent uh, with a high school senior here, I just want to say how much I respect and appreciate what you're doing for this community and what you're doing for literally thousands of children and their families, so thank you so much. Um, so just wanted to give you some information about something that's happening at the hospital, Northern Westchester Hospital, hopefully your community hospital, that's relatively new. So over the last few um, months, as senior leaders at the hospital, we've heard a lot of calls from the community. What are you doing about the opioid crisis? What are you doing about the opioid crisis? It's a big deal. It's like world hunger. We um, are not a detox facility. Um, there are some limitations. Our behavioral health unit it is for adults and over, um, but there are some things that we can do. And one of the things that we've started doing uh, since June of last year is we have instituted um, an evidence-based program called SBIRT. S-B-I-R-T in healthcare, we love acronyms, so we just threw another one in there. And it stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. And I'm taking the opportunity to share this with you because when you go into Northern Westchester Hospital's emergency room now, if you are 18 and above, 
even if you go for an ankle sprain, you will be asked a few very basic questions. Um, and again, they are evidence-based and they're um, done in such a way not to be threatening. All of our nurses wear a little button. It says, we ask everyone. And the goal is to take this opportunity to give our community the chance to think. Do I have maybe one too many glasses of wine a week? Um, has what I thought my sort of recreational use of whatever gone to that next level? I cannot say it enough that it is done in a non-threatening way, um, in a non-judgmental way. And then if we find from these brief questions that something stands out, um, a coach then goes in and will ask you, me, uh, a few questions about if you're interested, if we're interested in referral for a little bit more information. There is no finger pointing, it is just an opportunity to have a conversation. We have found that about 5% of people who are screened do in fact meet the criteria to go to that next step. And we all know for those people, it could be the difference between life and death at some point. So um, I hope you never have to come see us except for happy moments. But should you um, encounter this and you, I want you to go, oh, I know about this. And if you tell a neighbor, um, it's just one way that we are trying as your community hospital to address what we see as a need and another way to help our community. So um, I don't want to stand between you and Dr. Stumacher anymore, but any questions on SBIRT? No? Well, thank you. Dr. Schumacher. Viva Kiva, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And without further ado, Dr. Stumacher. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Kiva's awesome for those of you who don't actually know her that well in this room. And it's uh, an honor to work with her and, and the administration at the hospital. So, um, before I get into it, I just want to say this. Um, this talk is really meant for parents at schools, and since most of you in this room are probably parents or no parents, or hang out with parents, or teach kids, or whatever, it's still going to apply, but I want you to know that really it's the focus of the talk, not so much uh, partners in prevention, although it kind of crosses over. I have a lot of information. Kiva will tell you that I'm very talkative and I go through a lot of stuff really fast. And the truth is I didn't even cover all the things that I really think I should. This is the bare minimum that should be in this talk. I've been doing this talk since about August of last year. In every place I go to, I get a lot of questions. And then I put those answers in my next talk and I present it to the next talk. And so that way I get a lot less questions. No, my goal isn't the less questions at the end, but um, I figure if somebody had the question in, in you know, Chappaqua, then somebody else is gonna have the same question in Somers, and that way I'm kind of covering the same ground. So I am gonna go fast, and I apologize for that, but we all do wanna get home at some point in time. Um, and then I'll answer whatever questions you want. Also, it's gonna be videotaped, and also I'm happy to share my slide deck with anyone, um, and I'm happy to come back and speak to whoever and do whatever. Um, so second thing, I worked, before I worked at Northern Westchester, I worked at St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx, level one trauma center. I was there for 13 and a half years. About nine or 10 years ago, um, I was tasked with turning the hospital to a smoke-free campus. And so I learned all about smoking cessation and I got into it because as a lung specialist, um, I was very disappointed and disheartened to give people diagnoses of emphysema or lung cancer or talk to them about being on a ventilator for the rest of their lives. It's horrible. I mean, it's horrible to get that information. It's not so much fun to give that information. So I was very motivated to get into this field. And um, not only did I get the, the hospital smoke free, um, I got everyone who worked there off of cigarettes. Then I kind of rolled it into a clinic. And then I had a smoking cessation clinic, both in English and Spanish, for nine years. And I got people off of uh, smoking who were ex-crack addicts, ex-heroin addicts, ex-alcohol, and they all told me the same thing, which is that smoking cigarettes and getting off of cigarettes was the hardest habit to break out of all of them. Much easier to get off of crack than off of cigarettes. So there I am at Northern Westchester, um, 
happy that I'm in a new place and a new career. And then all of a sudden, the, um, the, we have a junior president's council. So a bunch of high schoolers from all over the different neighborhoods get together. They all hang out at the hospital, hanging out with uh, Kiva and all the C-suite people. What can we do this year? And they all decided they wanted to make uh, vaping their big deal. And nobody, everybody's like, what do you mean? We want to talk about vaping? Yeah, and we know some kids vape. They brought it to us. So then the hospital said, well, who the hell knows about vaping? So they said, hey, Rich, you do smoking cessation. I said, uh, okay, let me read the literature and let me see what I could find. And I actually got uh, somewhat scared once I kind of dug into it. And I said, okay, I'm in this for real. And then was at a meeting with, um, with Nita Lowy. I was at one of her councils with the superintendents. And then the word got out and then I kind of got on the circuit. And so here I am today. So, um, Everybody was asking me, is vaping healthy? And of course, the corollary to that is, is vaping is harmful. So you know the government refers to it as ENDS, or Electronic Nicotine Delivery System. I think it's a funny acronym because it could yield in the ends of your life. There is a lot of imagery that goes along with vaping. Um, and there's some of it's very powerful, like this one. Vaping is not cigarette smoking. It's not poison. It's not twins joined at the cheek. Uh, it's not some guy from Mad Men who's waiting for a martini when he gets home. And then you move on to this kind of imagery where if there was another version of this without the cancer risk, wouldn't we switch? We did, right? And so that's kind of powerful, right? Who would want to, you know, keep having a, a, you know, cancer risk? And then you could look at this kind of imagery. So it's a toe tag and it looks like a box of marbles. And then a line underneath it, it's the next generation cigarette for the next generation of addicts. And that's why I like this slide because it's a little bit of foreshadowing of what I'm going to get into. So... Um, up until very recently, I rolled out this really kind of great evidence-based, you know, uh, information, and I roll it out trying to get everybody to understand the way I see the world. And um, where I started was with these two studies. So um, one of them is from 2015, the British study. Released in 2015, um, the British Health Services looked at all the available literature, and they made a pronouncement that's, that vaping was 95% safer than cigarette smoking. And so everybody took that information and ran with it. Ah, vaping is safe. It's 95% safer then. And then, of course, later on in the same year, the British Medical Journal um, uncovered um, um, undisclosed links between some of the authors and Big Tobacco. So how accurate is this information? And then just to kind of show you a difference, uh, in America, in the CDC um, site, it says e-cigs and young people, a public health concern. So one is 95% safer and one is a public health concern. And then to make my life easier, um, the United States government finally released their version of what uh, the truth is of today anyway. So back in Jan January 23rd, uh, the National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine, after studying all the available literature, and they, they covered over 800 peer-reviewed scientific studies, they had their summary about you know, about vaping. And so what did they say? Here is their summary. Um, that the evidence suggests that while e-cigarettes are not without health risk, they are likely to be far less harmful. I love the words likely and far less. There's certainly no guarantee there in any way, shape, or form. Um, they may help adults who smoke conventional cigarettes quit. Again, we have the word may. Um, however, their long-term health effects are not yet clear, so the data is still out. And among youth, whose use of e-cigarettes is at a higher rate than adults, there is substantial evidence that e-cigarette use increases the risk of transitioning to smoking conventional cigarettes. To me, that is a very significant and very um, important point, which I'll dig into a little bit later. So their level of evidence is conclusive, which means like, yes, it's definitely this. Substantial, which means it's probably this. And then everything else below that is maybe it's a coin flip. Who knows? So I really only care about the conclusive and the substantial. All of you have on your tables, one of your tear sheets is actually just a review of all their data. So you don't have to memorize this. You don't have to worry about it. But I'm going to go into it a little bit in depth. And you guys can bring it home and chew it over with your family and your friends. And if you know any kids who are vaping. So there's conclusive and substantial evidence that if you're vaping, you're going to be exposed to nicotine. That one's kind of obvious, right? There's um, definite, there's conclusive and substantial evidence that you are, um, that in addiction to nicotine, most e-cigarettes contain and emit numerous potentially toxic substances. 
and that um, that um, these toxic substances from e-cigarettes are significantly lower when compared to conventional cigarettes. So here's the point. Yes, there's toxic stuff in it. Yes, it's less than cigarettes. And yes, you're definitely getting exposed to nicotine. Um, there's clearly dependence, which I'm going to get into in a little bit, and about nicotine addiction. There's conclusive evidence that completely substituting e-cigarettes for conventional cigarettes reduces your exposure to the carcinogens. Will that make sense? If there's less toxic chemicals in it, which doesn't mean there isn't, just less, then there's going to be less exposure to them. And there's substantial evidence that completely switching from regular use of conventional conventional cigarettes to e-cigs re results in reduced short-term adverse health outcomes in several organ systems. It sounds like such awesome double speak, right? It's like health adult double speak. What does that mean? What does it mean in the short term, we don't see too much damage to any of your organ systems? What does it mean in the long term? Who knows? This one, again, is extremely important to me. There is substantial evidence that in e-cigarette use by youth and young adults, it increases their risk of ever using conventional cigarettes. There's conclusive evidence that there's secondhand exposure. Um, although there's no substantial or conclusive evidence in cancer, everybody wants to know, does this cause cancer? So there is no available evidence, which does not mean that there is poor evidence. There's just no evidence yet whether or not e-cigarette use is associated with uh, cancer endpoints in humans. And there's limited evidence from animal studies to suggest or to support the hypothesis that long-term e-cigarette use could increase the risk of lung cancer or any cancer. So guess what this means? We'll know in about 20 or 30 years how dangerous this is. That's all. Um, there's conclusive evidence that you can be poisoned from the liquid. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so I just kind of covered everything, right? So now we all know how healthy or dangerous vaping is, right? And so why are we going to hang out? Well, let's get some coffee, get some donuts, hang out, get home early, maybe watch some uh, sports or whatever, and, and relax for the rest of the night. And the answer is that I think that we're really kind of looking at the wrong question. I don't really believe that we should focus too much on the question of whether or not vaping is safe or not safe. It's a distractor question. So I'm going to pivot for a second, and I'm going to talk about nicotine. Nicotine is a naturally occurring substance in the human body. It's in our nervous system. We all have it in our brain and our nervous system. And um, nicotine is also found in the tobacco leaf. And when you take a puff of a cigarette or a vape, the nicotine gets into your brain in about seven seconds. It, it um, affects your frontal cort prefrontal cortex and also your nucleus accumbens, a couple of other areas of your brain. And the long story short is it releases a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is the chemical in your brain that makes you feel pleasure or calm. And it triggers it right away. And so you get on this merry-go-round, which is where you take a hit of a vape, you get nicotine, you get a release of dopamine, you feel good. In between your vapes, your nicotine levels start to drop, so your dopamine levels start to drop, so you start to feel unsettled or uncomfortable, and your brain, not you consciously, your brain says, I think I need some more nicotine so that I can, still, I can start to feel better again. And then you get some extra nicotine, you bring your dopamine levels up, and you go around. So you're stuck on this merry-go-round all day long. But nicotine is much more insidious than that. So. This is a slide of um, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is the release of dopamine. If you look in the top right at cocaine, you'll see that if you take a hit of cocaine, the orange line, um, I don't know if this is working, the orange, the orange line here kind of goes straight up and down, so it's almost an immediate release of dopamine. It starts to flatten out. It takes about an hour and 20 minutes before you get your highest level of dopamine release from cocaine. Starts to slowly come down and then crashes and flattens out. These are different doses of morphine. This top one is 10 milligrams per kilogram. In my entire career, I've never given that much morphine. And you can see it's very, very flat and rounded. At the beginning, it takes about two hours before you get to your highest level of dopamine release. People who invented morphine did this on purpose so that you wouldn't get a high, so that you wouldn't get so addicted to morphine. And now if we look at nicotine here, we could see it's almost a straight line up. It's like instant. You go straight up for your dopamine release, and it takes about 20 minutes. The only thing that works as strong as that is methamphetamines, uh, like crystal meth, et cetera. And if you could see, their release of dopamine is, of course, massive up to 1,000. But that's not the end of this story. 
So this slide shows you that nicotine's drug profile is more addicting than the rest of these. But researchers have studied people smoke a pack a day. There's 20 cigarettes in a pack. Depending on what kind of mood you're in, speed, you're at work, you're hanging out and having a beer, you take between 10 and 20 puffs of a cigarette. So if you're smoking a pack a day, between 200 and 400 times a day, you're hitting the pleasure center in your brain, like this, like that mouse in that commercial, over and over and over again. Nobody does 200 to 400 hits of cocaine, of crack, or methamphetamine. They'd be dead in 30 minutes. So 200 to 400 times every day, you're hitting your pleasure center every day for 10, 20, 30 years. You create a new feedback mechanism, a new feedback loop in your brain, and you can't ever get off of these cigarettes. And that's why it's so much harder to get off of any kind of nicotine product than it is any of these other drugs. Not to belittle them, this is just really, really hard. And on top of it, then there's habits and stuff, which I'm not going to get into tonight, that kind of surround the drug addiction. So my point is, is that nicotine is, in my mind, the most addictive substance known to mankind. So let's move on. Now that we know that nicotine is highly addictive, let's talk about nicotine in the adolescent brain. I love this slide because uh, other than the hair color, it's pretty much my 16-year-old son. And um, we know that nicotine affects the prefrontal cortex over here. And so here's a slide of a functional MRI of a brain. Uh, I know it doesn't show well here. I have another slide with better pictures. On the top left, left is a five-year-old brain. On the bottom right is a 20-year-old brain. And I don't know if you could see this white circle over here. That's the prefrontal cortex. Um, and yellow green is less developed and dark blue purple is most developed. So the prefrontal cortex is the area which governs judgment and decision making. And this may help explain why teens who are more prone to participating in risk behavior are particularly vulnerable to drug abuse. So not with regards to nicotine, but in adolescent medicine in general, there's a ton of research on the prefrontal cortex and how slow it develops. And that is exactly the reason why teens act the way they do. That's why they don't understand risk the same way. That's why they do stupid things. And later on, they kind of grow up. Interesting. About 25 to 27 years old is when that area, your prefrontal part of your brain, is fully developed. And I found that that's around the time that your children come home and say, you know, mom and dad, you were right all along. You're so smart. And I can't believe I was always kind of, you know, ripping on you. And you're really great. So it really kind of coincides with the development of the brain. So here's just a list of some of the studies about some of the things that nicotine does on the adolescent brain. It can disrupt the growth of the brain circuits that control attention, learning, and susceptibility to addiction. It can increase your risk of psychiatric disorders, cognitive impairment, and attention deficit. So let's just look at this perfect storm. Nicotine is the most addictive substance known to mankind, and it's affecting the adolescent brain at exactly the worst time where their highest chances of becoming an addict is at that moment in time. So why is it so hard to talk about vaping and the dangers of vaping? And the reason why is because it's easy to talk about how dangerous cigarettes are. I show my patients this picture and I say, oh, would you drink some arsenic or methanol or you know, lighter fluid or ammonia? And everybody's going to go, no way. Everybody knows there's 80 carcinogens in a cigarette and over 7,000 different chemicals in a cigarette. And then you want to talk about vaping. And there's a ton of misinformation out there and a lot of misleading information. And it's done with intent. And the medical community is very divided over whether or not vaping is safe or not. Um, so far to date, there hasn't been a disease that someone has been diagnosed as due to vaping. So it's very easy to say, well, vaping isn't that dangerous. Like, let's not worry about it too much. So here's the list of the 42 chemicals so far that we know that are in vapes. The ones with check marks next to them are either cancerous or uh, extremely dangerous. The ones that are in red are in secondhand vape. People like to ask me about popcorn lung. So there's uh, some of these chemicals are called flavorants. So they're in there to give the um, vapes a certain taste um, or smell. And those things are called flavorants. Diacetyl and acetyl propionol are the two flavors that give you butter. 
back in the late 70s, early 80s, when they invented um, microwave popcorn. These are the chemicals that were in the popcorn. In the factory, everybody was breathing it in, a ton of it, and then everybody contracted bronchiolitis obliterans, which is a horrible pulmonary disease. Basically, it, you scar down your lungs, you can't breathe, you got no oxygen, and you really die a very unfortunate and unhappy life. It's not that your lungs look like popcorn. So those flavorants are in the vapes. So the people who are in the pro-vaping community say, well, these flavorants have been decided by the FDA that they're safe for food consumption, which they are. Because when you eat food, it goes into your stomach, and your stomach has a pH of 4.5. And when you inhale it into your lungs, which has a pH of 7.4, I don't know if that's going to be protective or not. Your respiratory epithelium was only meant to inhale one thing, air, nothing else. So it has a defense mechanism to be able to handle when it, it gets smoke or something that it's not supposed to get, and you cough and you, you, know, you get sick and then you get better. But it's not meant to be able to get that stuff every single day for 30 years. So this study came out literally last, no, two weeks ago now, um, and this is from the Journal of Pediatrics, and this is proof um, that you find these organic chemicals and these poisons in the bloodstream of adolescents who are vaping. So these are the unpronounceable chemicals that they were looking for, and this scattergram over here, the ones on the left are non-smokers, the one in the middle are vapors, and the one on the right are e-cigs um, and, and um, regular cigarette smokers. And we could see that the middle line is definitely bigger than the left line over here. So um, their results were these three chemicals, which I'm not going to try to butcher, were significantly higher in e-cigarette only users compared with controls, and that their findings can be used to challenge the ideas that e-cigarette vapor is safe um, and messaging to teenagers should include warnings about the potential risks of toxic exposures to carcinogenic compounds. When I dug a little bit deeper into the study, I found something very interesting. When they were looking at the different types of devices, they used vape pen, mods, jewels, and others. So we're going to get into jewels in a second, but jewels have become, it's a type of uh, vaping device. It's now become a verb, just like Xeroxing, you're also jeweling. And it's so prevalent that they gave it its own category. And it was about 25%. It was equal in all the categories. The other interesting thing was what was their usual flavor of e-cigarette that everyone liked. And fruit, candy, and menthol beat out tobacco flavored. So only five in tobacco and only two in tobacco flavored. And that's very important. And uh, um, it, it's, it's, again, another uh, piece of proof about how the tobacco industry is targeting our children, which I'm going to get into in a second. So then I went through these next bunch of slides to prove how e-cigarette use leads to cigarette use, conventional cigarette use. And I don't really have to go through them because you saw the slide at the beginning of the National Academies of, Stu of, of uh, Science and Medicine. They say it's very substantial evidence. Um, I just want to cover a couple of, of the other studies. This is back in October of 2017. This was in Canada. They looked at about 30,000 students, 2013-14 to 2014-15, and their conclusion was that e-cigarette use was strongly associated with cigarette smoking behavior. This study came out in December of 2017. It was done in Connecticut, 800 students. What was interesting about this was it's a crossover study. So if you're a cigarette user, did you become an e-cigarette user? And if you were an e-cigarette user, did you become a conventional cigarette user. And so their conclusion was e-cigarette use was associated with future cigarette use, yet cigarette use was not associated with future e-cigarette use. So this is just a one-way road for these kids. And um, like anyone else, when anyone else has the same conclusion that you do before you even talk to them and they have the same opinion, you think they're the smartest person in the world, right? You love when somebody agrees with you before you even tried to convince them. So their conclusion remark, I thought um, it was exactly what mine is, which is the rising frequency of e-cigarette use among youth over time is concerning, especially in light of evidence that e-cigarette use is a significant risk factor for future conventional cigarette use. And then this was another study just a couple of months ago that it isn't just e-cigs. It doesn't matter if it's dip or chew or hookahs or whatever else it is. Anything, any non-regular cigarette tobacco product leads you to conventional cigarette use. So this is becoming a big deal. Um, 
In December 2017, the Times reported on the NIH study. University of Michigan every year studies our children. I didn't realize this. And every year they release their reports. They look at about 40,000 kids and they look at their drug use, their alcohol use, their sex behavior, and their tobacco use. This is the first year that in addition to just asking whether or not they vape, but they asked what kind of vaping do you do? And the results were kind of startling. So in eighth grade, 13% of eighth graders are vaping, 24% of 10th graders, and 28% of 12th graders are vaping. And if you look at this box over here, as the kids get older, eighth and 10th and 12th, their nicotine level use goes up, their just flavoring goes down, and their marijuana use kind of stays flat. What I really liked about the people who did this study is that they were smart enough to put in the question that they don't know. I will argue that most of the kids do not know what they're vaping. They're told by the older kids, don't worry, there's no nicotine in it. Just so you know, all Juul products have nicotine. They don't create, they don't make anything without nicotine in it. So whether or not the older kids are telling the younger kids there's no nicotine in it, they have no clue. I also want to tell you that this number is, is probably very, very wrong. So since I started doing this talk, anytime I get near any kids, I always ask them, what, how many kids you think in your school are vaping? What do you think the percentage is? And it used to be greater than 50%, and now it's about anywhere from 75 to 90%. And I will tell you that, um, what's today, Monday? So was it Wednesday or Thursday last week? I was at, um, I was at, um, uh, um, right next to me, Westlake High School, excuse me. And Westlake High School had their students come to my talk instead of the kids, which was interesting to try and give this lecture to a bunch of teenagers at night. And they all screamed out that it was 90%, all of the kids, and it was 120 kids in the auditorium. So I want you to know that most of the kids in the high school are vaping, not all of them, just most of them. And they have no idea how addicting nicotine is. And here's really where it gets evil. So in 2013, 2014, um, the CDC, or the, excuse me, the FDA and their website cited their a study that said that current youth e-cigarette users cited the availability of appealing flavors as the primary reason for use. So what kind of flavors? So here's a list of some crazy flavors. The bottles look like little candy bottles. If you go to the store and you could buy strawberry liquid, you know, drops that you can give a kid. So these things are laying around in people's houses. So older adults who are using these e-cig liquids, liquids, they leave it around. And we get, um, uh, in the United States, a lot of ED visits now from um, infants and very, very young children who walk over, it smells like strawberry or creme brulee, it looks just like a candy bottle, so they open it up and they drink it and they overdose on nicotine. So here's another slide of what some of the other flavors, they come in exotic and fruity and savory tobacco menthol and different strengths of nicotine. In this slide, um, I thought it was a mistake. I thought it was just a menu and I was gonna order something from it because it looked delicious. Cookies and cream, peanut butter cup, crisp, cookie and milk, banana pancake, and this is actually in Englewood, New Jersey, the 201 Smoke Shop. And here's what you can, you can see that they just show you the bottle and then what the flavor is supposed to look like. I would argue that this is not geared towards the 50-year-old adult who's been smoking for 30 years who wishes to get off of cigarettes and use this device as harm reduction, right? There's only one type of person that this is aimed at, and that's a kid. So Jules are um, the, the product that's used most in Westchester County and probably in, in all of the United States of America. For those of you who don't know too much about Jules, and I'm going to get into it a little bit um, in a minute, and then we're going to um, hand out some of the products. Um, one of the pods, these are the pods over here. They have the liquid in it, and each one of these pods is about the equivalent of smoking a a pack a day. This comes from their website. At this time, all our Juul product pods include nicotine. And then they go on to say, no, nic no tobacco or e-liquid product should ever be considered safe. Inhalation of e-vapor may aggravate respiratory conditions. We recommend that you do not start. This comes from a blog, the Vaping Daily blog, and I like them because they have a soul. When you look at their vaping safety tips, look at their first sentence. If you do not smoke, do not start vaping now. 
They write, eliminate nicotine from your e-liquids. Always prefer child-proof bottles for your e-juices and be careful of your, um, of your um, batteries. So I'm going to have her pass around some of these different products. I think it's very important that everyone touches them, knows what they feel like, what they look like, what you should be looking for at home or to tell your friends. Hopefully all the stuff will get back to me. And um, <laughs> yeah, so um, it, I, I will, as a side note, just as, a, as, a, as an intermezzo while I have some um, water, I asked Kiva for money to have somebody go to a vape shop to buy vaping products. And she said, aren't you talking about how vaping is bad? And I said, yes, but they need to be able to touch these products. So usually at all the schools, I say, please make sure it comes back because it'll look really bad when I have to go into a vape shop to buy more stuff. And everybody's like, oh, that Stumacher's a fraud. I saw him in the vape shop buying crap. You know, uh, it won't work out well. So as we all know, nicotine isn't the only product that um, kids are vaping. Um, just as a side note, since this is um, Partners in Prevention, not that I am aware of it happening too frequently or even at all in Westchester, but you can vape anything. There are people vape ventinal patches, um, opioids. You can vape anything that you can put in there and start to burn. But the kids are vaping a lot of marijuana, THC. Um, there's a lot of different names for it. It's a very separate culture. It gets so in-depth that I don't really understand it too much, and I can't keep up with it. Like the word um, 710, the number 710 is the word oil backwards, and marijuana oil is what they're vaping. So now July 10th is also a big THC use day. What you guys um, should know is that back in the old days when we were young and stupid and did things that we shouldn't have been doing, uh, the THC content in loose leaf marijuana was around 10 to 20 percent. Nowadays, it's about 15 to 25 percent THC content. And what you should know in these products that the kids are vaping now, they're known as concentrates. And the reason why is because their THC contents are anywhere from 40 to 80 percent. And they're actually pushing 90 and over 90 percent. So the amount of THC that are in these products are so high, these kids cannot handle it. A lot of them will pass out. There's a new word called greening out rather than blacking out. I've been to a school district in Westchester where a kid has greened out in the classroom. Um, we do have kids that come through our emergency room with uh, either passing out or with seizures from vaping THC. And uh, we use Espert on them. And um, I, could, I could tell you a story about a kid who'd had a seizure and the kid was doing fine. And the doc said, you know, what are you doing? Are you using any substances? And the kid's like, no, I'm fine. So then the doc says, all right, I have to talk to the kid alone, ask the parents to leave, and starts to tell the kid, look, I understand. I just want you to know that with um, unknown etiology of seizures, you have to be on seizure meds for six months. We have to remove your driver's license for six months until you can prove that you're seizure free or we can find the cause. Before he could finish the sentence, I was vaping marijuana. Couldn't even finish explaining it. So the kids are getting a lot of product and they don't really know what they're getting themselves into. Marijuana definitely affects the adolescent brain just like nicotine does. It lowers satisfaction, lowers your ability to study, to um, pay attention, lowers satisfaction, less likely to go into college, decrease of your IQ by about eight points. And again, as they get to that area where um, their perception of harm decreases, their marijuana use increases. Over 3,000 kids try marijuana for the first time every day. Here's the obligatory disgusting New York Post picture of a battery blowing up in somebody. It's a real thing. It does actually happen. So we started off this lecture with a question, which is, is our e-cigarettes healthy or not? And what I offer is that e asking that question is really a distractor question because you can't really win. There's no definitive answer to this question. You could debate this all day long. And I don't like to get embroiled in that kind of a conversation because there's no end. What I like to discuss and is I like to reframe the question, which is should we allow our youth to vape? And the answer is clearly no. Our kids do not know what they're getting themselves into, and they're all becoming nicotine addicts. There's absolutely no acceptable reason why any child should be vaping anything at any point in time. 
I think that e-cigs and vapes are an acceptable tool for smoking cessation. By the way, they're not great. The literature is very mixed. It's about 50-50 about whether or not it actually helps you get off of cigarettes. At best, it just keeps you addicted to vaping instead of e-cigs, and there's nobody knows whether or not it leads you back to e-cigarette use later on. My advice is if you are addicted to nicotine in another form, pipes, cigars, smoking cigarettes, uh, you should go to a smoking cessation program. You should use you know, um, any of the medications that we have out there. And if I don't care if it's acupuncture, whatever you got to do, meditation, it's fine by me. If you cannot quit cigarettes or anything else by any other method, then I would say that you should vape overusing cigarettes which should not be misconstrued as me suggesting that any kid should ever be vaping in any way, shape, or form. I think non-nicotine flavored vaping liquid is a gross and ga an obvious gateway product that's aimed at our youth to enter into the nicotine addiction marketplace. And I want to be very specific about this. Currently, it's a $5 billion industry. It's projected to be a $10 billion industry. Um, Big Tobacco is late to the game. They're lobbying uh, all the legislature significantly in D.C. and everywhere else at the local level. Right now, the big players are the mom and pop shops, believe it or not. It's pervasive. It's all over the place, and it's flying all through the schools. And it's a perfect storm because now because of media and information being passed on and the way there's the new latest thing that the kids are into, whether or not it's the fidget spinners or whatever erasers, whatever the kid's getting into, this is the new thing they're getting into, except for this has nicotine in it. And it's highly addictive. So my opinion is, is that you should be protecting your child from becoming addicted to nicotine no matter what. Um, they're going to be spending the rest of their life battling a nicotine addiction. They're going to go through a lot of emotion, time, money, and effort. I believe that the ever-increasing vape use by our youth and the fact that it is clear that vaping leads to e-cigarette use means that we're going to have catastrophic health issues in about 20 to 30 years. And I, you know, I know it's a little bit flippant, but I'm going to be glad that I'm not going to be taking care of patients in 20 or 30 years because the heart attacks are going to go up like crazy. Uh, lung cancer, emphysema, it's going to be big. Because if right now these kids are wrong and it's not 90%, let's say it's only 75%, and let's just say only 10% of those kids go on to becoming smokers, it's going to be a huge uptick in conventional cigarette use in the United States, without a doubt, unless we do something about it and do something about it quickly. So what can you do about it? The first thing is you can educate yourselves. Don't just take my lecture for it, research at home. Be careful because the first couple of Google pages are all pro-vaping. It takes a little while to dig into the anti-vaping community. Um, I always advise my parents to have open, honest conversations with their kids that they should not be lecturing to or at their kids. I advise the 10-minute car uh, lecture. It works out very well. Um, when you're driving in the car, your kid isn't looking at you. There's no eye-to-eye -eye contact so that they're a little bit more comfortable. They're in, um, they feel a little bit less, you know, oh, they're, they're a little bit more likely to be open and honest with you. And then they also know that there's an end to the conversation because there's an end to the car ride, right? If you're driving to the mall, you're going to get out. You're not, you're not going to still talk about it as, you know, you're going into Brookstones or whatever, right? But if you go into your kid's bedroom at night right before sleep and say, let's start talking about vaping, Get out of here, Dad. Well, I, don't, I don't vape. They're never going to tell you anything, right? No, I'm holding that for somebody else. They don't want to get into that conversation because there's no end in sight. Um, you should meet with your local school leadership and try and figure out what they're doing and what you can do to help the schools deal with this in the school. I don't believe that this is just something that the school should be handling at all. I think it really should be at home. It should be honest communication between parents and children. I think school is just one of the areas that can help the people who have to handle this handle it. And then also at the lo local government and the legislative areas. So just very briefly, I want to show you guys what's going on with them because I know um, we're getting a little bit late. There's really three parts to an e-cigarette. There's a battery, there's a vaporizer or an atomizer where the liquid or the, um, or the um, oil or the butter or shad or whatever they call it um, gets um, kind of heated up. It's not actually lit on fire, so it's not combustible. That's why it's different than a cigarette. And that's how they get away from calling it vaping instead of smoking, because you're not creating smoke. You're creating vapor and then a cartridge that you breathe through. 
They're all essentially the same thing, but you can have them designed and specially ordered to look the way any way you want. These two look like cigarettes, and if you saw them at a party, you wouldn't know. These couple look like pens, so your kid could be having it on their desk, and you would not know that their pen isn't really a pen. Um, this is a vape pen, um, and one of those are going around. It's really a modifiable one, so you can actually put liquid in it. And these are called mods, and the reason why they are is because you can modify them, and I'll show you some pictures. But just so you know, they can kind of look like anything. The mods get very, very... Uh, um, technical and uh, very sophisticated with a lot of readout displays and there's really a lot of engineering that's behind it way beyond what I would ever be able to understand just so that you guys can get a feeling like this is a very big industry. So what are our kids using? They're using the jewel which is going around. This is a starter kit which goes for 50 bucks. Um, so there's a couple of pieces. This is the charger which goes right into your laptop and the charger is a USB port and it charges the battery part which looks like a memory stick so you can go into your kids room and they could be charging their vape and you wouldn't know it certainly in the schools they're charging them all over the place and it's hard to be able to tell and then this is the pod that goes in that has the liquid in on top um, these flavors um, are geared towards your kids and when you go and you buy refills, they're only $5 a pod. You can only buy them in a four pack. So it's 20 bucks to get this four pack. So they're cheaper than cigarettes. Um, Fix is a competitor brand. Um, basically, it's the same thing, but it's uh, diamond shaped instead of rectangular shaped. I have this picture to show you that, although it's not showing up very nicely, when you run out of the juice, if you want to buy extra e-juice, instead of buying these pods, you can just um, hack it. So on YouTube, there's zillions of videos on how to hack all of these things and change them and make them work for you. This is a more advanced kind of mod, um, which is popular in New Jersey. It doesn't seem to be popular here yet, um, but this is the next level up. It's a much stronger battery. There's a lot more e-juice in this, and you just pop in the cartridge of whatever flavor you like. And of course, for the, um, for the women, they can color coordinate it with their outfits. So it's very kind of them. Vaping the THC, um, Pissing Excellence is one of the brands that's out of California where it's legal, where for some reason it finds its way here to New York. Um, and this is just, it's not really showing very well, but there's lots of different interesting flavors that you can get. Um, so it's essentially the same thing, which is a battery and then a vaporizer and then a mouthpiece. And the way they sell them is that they just have the vaporizer and the mouthpiece together and you could get extra ones and you screw it in. The reason why I'm showing you this is that, and there's a vaping case that's been floating around. The screw in for this is very different than the jewel. So it screws in directly rather than makes an L shape. So if you see one that, you're, that screws directly into the USB port, then your kid's probably vaping THC and not nicotine. Um, this slide doesn't show up very well, but this is also Pissing Excellence, it's gelato, but it also advertises the THC content, which is 82 point whatever percent. Just so you know, these are some other ones I found online. Um, the way they make these extracts is they take the, um, the marijuana and then they kind of boil it down and they kind of extract all the, as much of the THC and cannabinoids and uh, cannabinols that they can. And so butane is one of the products that they generally do this with, which of course if you're inhaling a lot of butane will, you know, scar your lungs and it'll be a miserable death for you anyway. So in California especially, they're advertising things like solvent free to make sure that you're using the healthiest of your THC products. Um, then this one is of course called discreet because they're very good about having very little odor. This one says no propylene glycol or glycerin, which are the precancerous. So they're letting you know we don't have any of that precancerous stuff in our THC. This one just looks like a cigarette. It's a 200 hit cigarette and then you're good and you throw it out. This also, um, I just wanted to, it's not showing up, but there's lots of different products that you can get. This one I just wanted to show you because they're, and they should be proud, they're already up to 92% THC. 92%. So um, you can just get the liquid, um, and so they come in these push applicators. So if you see some syringes laying around your kid's house, um, I don't know if you're rooting for heroin or THC, I'd be rooting for THC. Um, Hopefully that's what it is, but it will look similar. These ones actually tell you what kind of cat, you know, uh, it's sativa or a different kind of brand and what their THC uh, content is. And it looks like different colors. So I just wanted to make sure everybody got an idea of what it looks like. Yeah. 
So in New York, um, I, was, I was at a talk in Mount Kisco and we had a drug enforcement officer from Westchester County. Um, in New York right now, leaf marijuana um, under one ounce is a misdemeanor and any kind of extract is a felony. So this is jail. And the kids don't know that at all. So I don't know how they get it. I don't know if they can get it on the internet. They're certainly getting Juul off the, inter, um, off the internet. Um, it's found its way here. The kids can find and get whatever they want. They don't know that it's a felony at this point in time. Yep. Yeah, uh, these are basically here to be um, fairly big companies that have probably had some form of operational quality control. Is there any uh, company or any way that people are doing the knockoffs? Yes. That are just... Uh, Correct. So the question is, 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 is are there non-company or, or non-industry made um, extracts? And yes, there is a lot, and it is floating around a lot. Um, and I don't know how it could or would be regulated at this point in time. I have seen it. Um, I know this is going to sound odd, but if somebody was going to show me between two products that they were going to use, I would much rather them use a product that was actually made by a company that... Um, you know, has some kind of follow through with it and advertises how clean their product is. So I don't, again, I want to be careful. I'm not advertising anyone use this product, but if you were going to use an unknown, you know, uh, um, provider versus someone who actually has a company that, you know, produces this, that would be your safer bet. Is there a secondhand smoke? Uh, from the THC? So there's definitely secondhand smoke from the vaping and uh, from the nicotine vaping and the chemicals have been found in people. So yes, you can get it from secondhand vape. As far as THC is concerned, I would have to assume yes, although I haven't seen any studies because if you're breathing it in, you're breathing it in. One of the questions I'm usually asked is can you smell it? And so the answer is, is that you can either smell it not at all or very, very little. I've been at two separate um, parties where I've seen adults using it and it's not my thing. So I said, all right, I need to stand next to you because I need to be able to look people in the eye and tell them honestly rather than what other people are telling me. And in both times, there was a very faint odor and it lasted for about five seconds and then poof, it's gone. And scary gone, scary gone fast. It doesn't stay on the hair, it doesn't stay on the clothes. So if your kids are doing it in their rooms and you're walking in their room five minutes later, they're, I mean, other than they're obviously stoned, you're not going to be able to smell it, unfortunately. So um, the other handout that you guys have, um, um, I got off the internet, off the uh, uh, CDC website. I really like it. It's a tear sheet for parents and how parents can talk to their kids about vaping. Um, I want to point out that they, the, the first thing they say is be patient and be prepared to listen. They have a whole bunch of the questions that the kids are going to ask, followed by the answers that you can give them. So it's really good because it gives you the ability to be able to have a good conversation with your child. I want to um, suggest that you use a technique we use um, um, in medicine about ask, don't tell. So as a doctor, I'm an agent of change, right? Patient comes into my office and they're not eating the right way or they're not taking the medications the right way. And I could say, hey, you need to take your pills. And it's not that much of a meaningful conversation. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to take my pills and then boom, they're out the door. But I'm looking for behavior modification. I'm looking for you to say, why am I doing something a certain way and why should I do it another way? And so one way to get people to change their behaviors is to engage them in discourse rather than talk at them. And so especially with children, especially with adolescents, I advise ask, don't tell and ask them questions and get into a conversation, don't expect to finish it up in a few minutes. So what do you know about vaping? Or do you know a lot of kids who are vaping? Don't ask the kids names. What do you think you know about it? Oh, I went to a lecture, I learned some interesting things. And you keep coming back at it. Oh, did you know this fact? Did you know that fact? That will get you much further in talking with an adolescent than just saying, did you know I went to a lecture, vaping is bad for you, you should stop. So. Um, Interestingly enough, um, just last month, the New York Times also had a, 
an article on how to talk to teenagers with vaping. And again, like I pointed out before, I love people who have the same ideas I do, so they kind of covered the same topics. I suggest you read this article if you want to get a little bit more in depth, but their major points were accept that facts don't go far, especially with adolescents. You could say this is really dangerous for you and you're going to be a nicotine addict, but that doesn't mean anything to them at this point in time in their lives. Getting their perspective matters. What's your take on e-cigarettes? See, ask, don't tell. Ask why before suggesting why not. Share your concerns and concede the limits of your power. It's a very nice article about how to change behaviors in adolescence. Um, and then just a couple of days before it, there was an article on cool looking and sweet Juul is a vice teens can't resist. So Juul is just so pervasive and so insidious that they just had a whole New York Times article just on the Juul because that's what our kids are using. Just to uh, turn a little bit and get through the rest of it, um, Maureen Kenny um, was kind of to share some of her article, uh, her slides about policy solutions. New York State finally banned um, vaping back in October of 2017. This is a picture from a convenience store in uh, Westchester. Um, it looks like any kind of candy store. Here's the ice cream, and right in front of it, you wouldn't be able to tell, but these are all vaping products. It's not legislated to the back of the shelves just yet, so it's purposefully put right in front of our children. There's a Clean Indoor Act. You can't vape inside schools, inside hospitals, inside any public place. You can't vape at playgrounds. Um, and then liquid nicotine sales. So in New York State, you can purchase nicotine products at 18 years old. In New York City, it's 21. In certain counties, it's 19. Um, when I spoke at Chappaqua, they, the, uh, one of the um, town legislature was there and told me that they were um, trying to pass uh, some legislation that would say that you had to be 21 years old to be able to purchase any kind of vaping products in their um, district. In addition, they also zoned out any cell sales of any vaping products a thousand feet from any church or playground or school or house of worship, et cetera. So by the time they got done with that, they pretty much uh, zoned it out of their community. Um, and so you can really kind of work with your, your partners. Um, so it got me thinking when I learned about that and I decided I would just put in your zip code here where we are right now and show you a screen grab from today of where your local vape shops are um, compared to where we are in the zip code. And then I realized that vape shops aren't the only places that sell vape products. So I went to Jules' website and I put in the zip code. And this is where we are. I don't know if it's showing up, but these little blue dots that are all over the place um, up here, up here, up here are um, other places where you could buy Jules. So at the Route 6 uh, fuel station, at the Yorktown Food Mart. So the bottom line is, is the gas stations are also selling this. Of course, the kids can go online and just lie and say, yes, I'm 18 years old. They could use a debit card that you're not tracking. Or, of course, they can get it from their older siblings. Just so you know, in the school districts, um, it's a, a hot secondary market item. People are selling this. The older kids are selling it to the younger kids. That little piece, right, that little fob that goes into the computer, uh, the kids lose their, their phones or iPhones. You know how easy it is to lose that thing? Those things are worth 20 bucks. Um, for any kids who lose there. So there's a lot of secondary gain for the kids in selling the products as well. So what's the summary? Vaping is probably bad for you, but we're not going to know for 20 to 30 years. There's definitely carcinogens in it, no matter what anybody says. We just don't know what's going to happen. What is in there is nicotine. It's the most addictive substance to mankind. Our kids are vaping at anywhere from 75 to 90%. Clearly, vaping leads to e -cig to regular conventional cigarette use, and the kids are vaping THC. And it's going to require a lot of work on a lot of our parts to make sure these kids understand that they're being turned into nicotine addicts. These companies are targeting the kids with vaping liquid flavors on purpose, and we need to help the kids understand what they're getting themselves into. Thank you. Yes. I want to thank you for uh, your presentation. Thank you. you know, we have all community leaders here. We have representation from John Kennedy High School, Somers High School, we have the police, we have the Lions Club, we have the Rotary here. Uh, yeah. But this is like a, you know, this is like a tidal wave and you're offering us a robot. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I, I Listen, when I got into the literature, I got nervous. You see it, right? It's I, I showing you the way it 
this is life according to Richie. That's all I could tell you. You can spin it any way you want. At the end of the day, it's a nicotine addiction and it's being sold to our kids. Well, I want to thank you for letting us film this. Yeah. Because I, we're going to make this available to anybody that, anyone in our community leaders that want to take this and deliver it. I would love to have your presentation. Thank you. And uh, more questions, please. Hi. What's, yeah, what's the alternative? I got four, four boys at home. Okay. okay. My youngest are, are, are twins, the 19, but they went to college. So, I've been through the, you know, the, 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 the school years. And, so and, and just staying on top of your kids is a, it's a full-time job. And what I, the question that I always ask is, if not that, then what? You know, you have to give them an alternative to all these things that what they want to do. And that's, and that's always been, I think, one of the biggest concerns I have. And we have great community leaders here you know, the Lions Club, the, you know, um, but the SCF and all these organizations, but I, I'm not necessarily talking about what some of us, but a lot of other organizations, other municipalities, don't have that infrastructure for organizations. So how do we provide kids with the alternative to do things other than vape or smoke or pot? So that's a great question. Um, and, um, Certainly from a physician perspective, I'm not qualified to answer it. From a dad perspective, you know, I hear a lot about sports and friends and keeping the kids focused. And, you know, um, what I think, honestly, is that this piece of information that I've shared with you guys should be um, really aimed at the parents of fourth and fifth graders, sixth and seventh graders. I think that they need to start on the kids that are early before they've been asked any questions, uh, you know, or offered these kinds of products. Um, Kiva does a lot of work in our outreach community, and she has a, a lot of really great people, Amy Rosenfeld and some other people in our respiratory therapist, Jackie, go out into the school districts, and they talk to the middle schoolers about um, smoking. Once I kind of learned all this back in November, um, I had the respiratory therapist pivot and now only spends a third of her time talking about smoking and two thirds of her time about vaping. And one of the things we do is have them do a little bit of role play because we tell them that no matter what, you're gonna be at a party sometime in the near future and some kid's gonna say, here, vape this. And it's gonna be a lot of pressure for you to take this vape and everyone's gonna tell you it's not that big a deal and it ain't cigarettes. And we have them practice saying no and we have them practice going through the ritual of being able to say no before it's their first time to do it. How do you provide them with some other kind of fun or interesting to, thing to do that isn't illegal or isn't gonna hurt their body? Is it alcohol, is it drugs, is it driving recklessly? Is it you know, risky sexual behavior? I don't know. I, you know, I think there's a bigger ethical discussion here which is, is the human animal right because we're really all just animals anyway that we work off of instincts and we try and use our higher level brains to not do the things that all of a sudden pop in our head and tell us to do them and um where we are in society today with the amount of information and media and imagery and speed with which this stuff goes on um there's no way to to uh, unring that bell um so my perspective is good messaging really early <laughs> before the kids get there so that when they get there they're like oh yeah this is what I was told about and at least they have some of the tools on how to say no beforehand and then parents who are involved and stay on top of it and don't beat your kids up and if your kid has a beer when they're 16 years old you're not smacking them over the head because they're turning into an alcoholic but you say these are the risks and this is what you need to know and this is why you shouldn't be binge drinking etc cetera, etc cetera. but for me this nicotine thing this is crazy Sorry, you had a question over here? I just wanted to know, what, um, you say, you know, there's a certain part of it which is all against the law. What if your child is arrested? Will any um, residue from these vaping show up in when they um, say they have to do like a hair follicle test or something like that? Would any of that show up? In so I'm going to defer to the officers, but I will tell you, yes, any THC will stay in either your saliva, your urine, your blood, or your um, hair follicles, depending on whatever the, the times are, and I don't remember them exactly. I think hair follicles is the longest at about a month. I don't know what they really do to test or not test, but the answer is 
it's THC whether or not you're smoking a joint or vaping it. But it's an excellent question. I hope I didn't scare anybody tonight. I just want you to understand that it's a very serious health risk for our children. Um, it's very prevalent in sports. A lot of the kids are vaping. Everybody thinks it's no problem. It's cool. Um, it gets passed on to all the kids all over the place. I have kids in high school. I ask them the questions of what's happening. Thankfully, my kids don't vape because they know I'll kill them. Um, <laughs> And they've been hearing me be scared about nicotine since before vaping was really prevalent anyway. So they know that that's the thing that doesn't work for me in my household. Um, and unfortunately, when they get to college, it's going to be a much harder deal because from my understanding, and I haven't looked into this myself, but, but vaping is tremendously prevalent in college campuses. Um, and again, I think there's messaging that it's safer than cigarette smoking. So it's really no big deal. And then they get addicted. Um, and then you see where you are. What are you saying the legislative response in this area? And from a timeline point, we're in a discovery right now. Yes, we are. So there's a lot of efforts, at least at the DC level, that I'm aware of. And I don't know how far they've gotten. The last time when I'd met with Nita Lois, she had told me that that the Surgeon General was working on decreasing the nicotine amounts in um, the cigarettes. And they thought that that was a good idea. And, um, you know, being a typical New York Jew, I started to laugh at her and say, you know, that's great, good for you. I said, so you're giving more profits to the tobacco companies, right? And she's like, what do you mean? I said, so everybody takes in the amount of nicotine they need, right? You know, people smoke three cigarettes a day and they can't get off of cigarettes no matter what. And you know people who smoke two packs a day. Everybody gets whatever it is that they need. So if you half the amount of nicotine in the cigarettes, they're gonna smoke twice as many cigarettes to get the amount of nicotine that they need. If they wanted to smoke less, then they know that they can go from 20 cigarettes to 18 to 15, whatever, and cut back. So I said, who's sponsoring this bill? Um, so that was the last time I had heard about that. Um, as far as the vaping is concerned, in Westchester, there is a young student in um, Chappaqua who clearly wants to be president one day. And he was telling me that he had been on the staff, uh, Chuck Schumer's staff, and that he wants to try and help write or create a bill um, um, making it illegal to sell flavored vaping products in New York State, which is an interesting tactic because clearly it's aimed at the kids, and then clearly what's left over is non-flavored tobacco products, which would help people get off of their cigarettes. So it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I don't know that there's enough money in the camp of anti-vaping to be able to battle the $5 billion industry that makes it worthwhile to open up a mom and pop shop like 201 smoke shop or to sell jewels all throughout the United States of America. I don't know who's gonna win that one. All right, guys, I really appreciate your attention. Thank you guys for coming out. I'm always happy to help and to answer any questions and you guys could always get in touch with me through Kiva and um, thank you. Thank you again all for coming and there are refreshments in the back.